Welcome to uh, CS um, 4510. This is L15. Uh, this is CS 4510. Uh, L, I think, 15A. We're three fourths of the way through the course. The topic of today is computational complexity. Just a sort of gentle introduction uh, to what is one of the hardest fields of study, in my opinion. Um, so let's see, where did we leave off? Last time we finished the recursion theorem and Kolmogorov complexity. We basically finished most of the great main theorems of the unit on computability theory. So computability theory is, in some sense, uh, a precursor to computational complexity, computability theory. And then here we have complexity theory, computational complexity theory. Computability theory, we were concerned with what are the fundamental limits of computation. We had a lot to cover, and we covered some really esoteric uh, theorems. There was some philosophy involved in there somewhere, somewhere along the lines. Um, and we had kind of a, like, a, like a hero's journey through um, mathematicians and their failure and the hubris, the rationality, and all these other big words. And we showed they failed to do all these kinds of uh, things. Now, computability theory after Alan Turing, was, it started and finished with Alan Turing. There was a series of papers that solved inconsequential problems. Once we knew undecidable problems existed, uh, some people were, spent time studying the unsolvable and its structure. But of course, by the nature of it, you can't study it too much. You can study a little bit, you know. Um, there was, most of the theorems in computability theory are solved. I mean, most of the problems of interest to computer scientists are resolved. I mean, we're bored with the field. The only people studying computability theory anymore are Europeans. And they're sort of doing, I don't know, exactly what. But uh, one of the last theorems that was important was the Hilbert's 10th problem which we discussed last time, or uh, the time before, given a polynomial, uh, a, di a, a um, Diophantine equation, does it have integer coefficient solutions or not? Uh, this took 25 something years to solve. It took, it was a global effort uh, by many people, four people. And then after that, there's not really anything applicable, uh, of applicable interest to like computer scientists. Everything is really uh, like, there are, of course, still open problems in this area. Does there exist this kind of specific reduction or something? But they're not really interesting problems. So a generation of computer scientists moved on to study computational complexity theory. Now, of course, there are still mathematicians studying computability theory. But in the, in the nature of computer science, we're studying complexity theory now. Computability theory, we are concerned with what problems are solvable at all. What algorithms have Turing machines for them at all? Does the Turing machine exist at all? For complexity theory, we're concerned with measures of efficiency. Given a machine, does it uh, take a certain number of steps or not take a number of steps? You can, it's not just like, is this problem solvable? Does there exist a Turing machine for it? But is there an efficient algorithm for such a, for such a problem? Um, what makes certain problems kind of tractable? What does it make them intractable, you know, hard or easy. So here is a measure, uh, comp com computability theory is a measure of hardness, excuse me, a measure of possible or impossible. Complexity theory is a measure of uh, hard or easy. But in some sense, if something is too hard, it might as well be impossible. So my job today is to convince you, although we had all this cool uh, extremal theorems, complexity theory is actually just as cool, even if it's more of an applied science. It is still as interesting. If a problem is not impossible, but you know that the shortest algorithm to solve the problem takes a million years, it might as well be impossible, right? Um, in some sense, complexity theory is like an intuitionistic version of computability theory. And there will be many parallels we'll draw, we'll draw between the two fields even today. We have solved basically every problem in uh, computability theory of interest. We were able to prove that undecidable languages existed, even for varying definitions of what an algorithm was. And we did so by this diagonalization technique. Right? Everything was a diagonalization self-referential uh, technique. Right? The diagonalization as a, as a class separation technique is you're given a set of objects. You can define an element to be distinct from all of those, and therefore not an element of the class. Diagonalization is a separation tool. Given A is a subset of B, you can say it's not, uh, it's a strict subset. Diagonalization allows you that power. Now, essentially every theorem as we proved in, in computability theory was diagonalization. Did you raise your hand? Oh, okay. Every theorem we proved in, in complexity, in computability theory was diagonalization. 
But and complexity and, and diagonalization does have a, an important role in, comp in complexity theory, as we'll see. Many of the first and early theorems in complexity, including the first theorem in complexity theory, is proven using diagonalization. But in fact, ironically, we know the limits of diagonalization um, and that there are limits to this. So the, every theorem, com complexity theory is characterized um, in a really bad way. So computability theory, if you were to cast these into movie genres, computability theory would be like a drama, right? Uh, there was all these, you know, philosophical... Um, ideologies and competing viewpoints and things like this, and then somehow the uh, theorems, which are supposed to be independent of meeting, could say something about this one way or the other. Uh, and the, there is a, you know, a big bang at the end where you know, we prove undecidable problems to exist. And although we didn't maybe like the solution, we don't like that there are undecidable problems. We can't disagree that there was a solution to this. right? Um, in contrast, so computability, it is drama, but it's like a finished movie. A complexity theory, in contrast, is, is like a horror movie in the sense that we have no idea how to solve any problem ever in complexity theory. We're really good at asking questions, and then we accidentally prove that we can't really answer the question easily. So in some sense, we don't know how to solve anything in complexity theory, but we know how, to, we know how, we know how hard it is to solve things in complexity theory, like provably know how to solve it in complexity theory. The field is characterized by one question, and my own personal interest in the field is because of this one question, which is the P versus NP question. This is a question that is now marking its... 53rd birthday. Um, the computer science as a science is getting old that the people who were first uh, starting the field are now slowly dying off. And um, they're retiring. And the question remains unanswered. You know, So certain questions remain open for long enough to get a certain uh, like uh, a wrap around people trying to solve this. You know, There's many unsolved questions in mathematics. What are some? Goldbach conjecture, Yang-Mills, you guys know any others? Twin prime. Twin prime conjecture, right? Many of these questions are are open. There's probably a few more I can think of. Anyway, the, um, many of these problems. Oh, uh, Colatz conjecture, three x plus one or n over two, right? The piecewise function. Um, many of these function are, functions are uh, and, uh, until 1994. It was also Fermat's last theorem. Many of these problems are interesting because, like. The statement of the theorem, none of the mathematical tools, if you think of every theorem as a, as, a, as, a, as a little ratchet in a big toolbox, none of them seem to fit onto the theorems well. Like We can't really apply any of the theorems that we know into those hard problems. People have tried and they've failed. Complex, P versus NP is a totally different problem than those, because although we cannot prove the problem right now, we can prove how much we can't prove the problem, which is kind of ironic. We can actually prove, and we will prove in this class, probably my favorite theorem is the relativization barrier, that we can prove that P versus NP has, cannot be proved via diagonalization. We can use diagonalization to separate two classes, but we can prove that you can't prove P does not equal NP via diagonalization. That is interesting. That's probably one of my favorite theorems. Now, the application of that theorem is a little subjective, and it does have some uh, room for like uh, intuition, I, I, I suppose. But it does is, is one result in a long line of results that characterize how hard this problem is. So let me plot a made-up graph. Um, this is a graph of like how close we are, we think, to solving P versus NP. So Cook defines the problem in 1971, and we're like confident that we can solve it. And then in like 1975, um, uh, we get what's called the relativization barrier, and the relativization barrier, a barrier in general, is, a, is a, basically a statement which says this certain kind of class of proof techniques cannot prove these things. Like you can prove, if there is a proof at all, the proof went, can't look like something. That doesn't help at all telling us what a proof can look like, but it's still scary, okay? So we get the relativization barrier, and it's over. Okay, No one knows anything that doesn't fit into the specific framework of the relativization barrier. The relativization barrier appears to apply, uh, apply to everything anyone has done so far in complexity theory, almost. That's sort of a perhaps an, a wrong statement at this time, but that's what happens in 1975. Uh, several years pass. In 1981, 1984, we get, a, we get some attempts to try to solve P versus NP using combinatorial methods on circuits. 
a circuit is just a directed acyclic graph with a complicated argument. You could make analogies between languages and uh, circuits. And well, actually, maybe we can prove uh, using these complex circuit techniques, which do not appear to relativize, that P does not equal MP. So there's like some hope again. People prove some theorems. Uh, Rasborov proves that there's no monotone circuit. We'll, we, don't, we don't care what that is. A monotone circuit is a, a circuit of only and and or gates. He proves there's no polynomial sized monotone circuit for clique. Clique, you should know, is an NP complete problem. Recall everything we did in 3510. So there's like, wow, he proved a super polynomial lower bound on an NP complete problem. Wow, and we, we're going to solve P versus NP tomorrow. And then the next paper, he proves actually if you add not gates, then the proof doesn't work anymore. So it's over. It's doomed. Um, there's still hope that circuit techniques will work. And then Rasborov and Rudich in like 1995 proved P versus NP has no natural proof. We won't talk about what that means. But basically what that means is all the circuit techniques don't work. So it's over. Um, this should be like a smaller bump. Something like that, right? Um, this is like 1981 to 1995, OK? That's a long enough time for someone to build a career. By the way, the 1981 first result in this was done by Merrick First, who's a professor here. He proved with Sachs and Sipser uh, that the XOR of n bits does not have a constant depth polynomial size circuit. Very trivial lower bound, but it took this, it, it took this incredible technique of uh, the probabilistic method to get something like that out of this. Um, 1995, we're out of stuff. People figure out, hey, well, wait a minute. You can do this thing with polynomials. And it feels to escape the two black holes that we invented previously. So there's this thing called algebraization, arithmetization. And it's like, well, maybe this can work for P as NP. And then in like 2006, Wigderson and Arison proved actually, no, it doesn't work. And then so we don't like have anything else anymore. We have no techniques that don't appear to fall into one of these three black holes. But the point is that the P versus NP problem, complexity theory in general, the history of complexity theory is a history of failure, right? So write that down. Uh, everybody has failed. This is, there's no other problem that has a kind of lore like this, where people try and fail to solve a problem, but they fail not of their own personal failings, but the entire th mathematical theory they develop to cope with the previous failure collapses. We know a ton about circuit complexity now, yet we still, we have developed so many theorems about circuit complexity, uh, combinatorial methods on circuits. Yet, the one thing that we hope to prove with combinatorial methods and circuits we know is unreachable. So what was the point of all that? Why did we do any of that? You know? this, is a, you know, this is enough time for people to develop. The scale of this is enough for people to develop specialization in a certain technique. There are people who've built their whole careers on the specific circuit method. right? They're like experts in this one technique or something. And then when Rasborov and Rudich came off, we killed off a generation of scientists. You know? Now, this arc has happened several th times throughout history. And there are even minor ones that are not directly applicable to the P versus NP problem. You know? There was one that's like, oh, you want to use certain methods on polytopes to solve traveling salesmen? Exponential size. Very specific barrier. Not very applicable to P versus NP, but still, can't use that way in. In some sense, we are farther away from solving the problem than when, for, ironically, we are farther away from the solution to the problem than when we first started. We have grown more distant from finding a solution than when the problem was first announced because we are no longer naive to the structure of the problem. We still don't know how to solve the problem. So one more quick comment on P versus NP is that you can think of the work done in computability theory as this difference between the decidable and recognizable problems. We had like LTM, right? And then we were able to prove recognizable problems were like this. And we were able to show that there was a recognizable un but undecidable problem, right? And then we were able to show, actually, if you included the co-recognizable problems, uh, we'll redefine what these are later today, that, well, we know kind of what the structure looks like. P versus NP really is an analog of the same thing, but casted not to mean a fit, uh, algorithm exists at all, but efficient algorithm exists. What we, the relationship between P and NP looks kind of like this. And we'll prove rigorously today what P and NP are. There's also a class you wouldn't believe what it's called. It's called co-NP, and it looks like this. Not only do we, know, we, not, only do we not know if uh, P equals NP, we don't even know if NP equals co-NP or NP doesn't equal co-NP. We don't even know if P 
is not equal to the intersection of NP and co-NP. Now, we'll talk today extensively about the class P being the efficient analog of the decidable languages. Why is NP an analog of the recognizable languages will take some time for us, but it, 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 it really is. So this really is just uh, the same problem in a different, in a slightly, with a slight, with a slight um, additional constraint on it, and suddenly we can't do anything with it. I mean, the problem's really hard, you know. Uh, right. My job today is to convince you that although that other stuff was interesting, computability theory was great, that complexity theory is exactly as interesting, maybe more, simply because of how hard everything is. That's my job today. Yes? So we know that there are some techniques that don't work for P versus NP. Yes. Do you know if there exists a technique that will work, or is there a chance that... Ah, if you could up. prove that a technique would work, wouldn't you prove the not, question? Not as, just that there is a technique that could work. Not, we don't know what that technique is, but like that it is provable. For there is, I see. Level. So there is some question about, is the P versus NP problem independent? Could it be independent of set theory? Does there exist a proof at all? And in this small period here, there was some work done on this. There was like, actually, there are some questions in complexity theory you can formulate that are not that are independent. Somebody gave a somebody was able to construct an algorithm that obviously ran in quadratic time, but you could not prove it ran in quadratic time. Something weird, things like this. And there was a small period people believed this to be true. And now we don't believe it at all. Like nobody nobody believes that the P versus NP problem is like formally independent of set theory, just that the proof is quite difficult. That's really what 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 it means. There are people working on trying to prove independence of such problems from very small fragments of piano arithmetic, and they are having some success. But in general, there's no, it's, it's not believed to be the case that P versus NP can be independent of set theory. Something like this. That's not, that's not believed to be possible. But you may think of these barriers as kind of like a, a barrier to the provability. If you were to create a, somehow like a set of axioms that from those sets of axioms you could only have relative, relativizing proof, then a proof of the relativization barrier would be a proof of the independence from those sets of axioms. Um, but uh, attempts to formalize this in notions of logical independence have been filled historically with controversy and uh, error. So, yes? I'm sorry, if you're able to prove that no proof will be able to prove that P equals NP, do you prove that P does not equal NP? Not necessarily. And that's actually one of the reasons that we don't believe it's independent. Because there are other theorems, not P, not equal NP, but like um, the continuum hypothesis. The continuum hypothesis says there is no car the set of cardinality between the naturals and the power set of the naturals. So you may take that statement or its negation as an axiom and derive no real consequence except for those from the axiom itself. It doesn't really matter. Some, there was a, 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 Abby Wigerson just won the Turing Award. He has a great book. You should read it. One of the last comments in his book is something like, we, maybe we shouldn't try to prove it. Maybe we should just take it as an axiom, that P is not equal NP. I mean, the physicists take the speed of light as some constant as an axiom, and no one has argued with them about it. But why, not, why shouldn't we do the same? You know, maybe we can't prove it, but experimentally, it appears to be the case that P is not equal NP. Yes? What does that give you as an axiom? That P is not equal NP? So like, if you assume P is not equal NP, you get all of cryptography. In fact, cryptography is conditional on the existence of one-way functions, which, is, which exist if and only if P does not equal NP. Many other such implications. Like, we have no idea what the actual case of the world is, but we have pretty good evidence that it looks a certain way. We just can't prove it. We believe that there are problems in NP that cannot be proven to be NP. We just don't know how to... That can't be NP. We just don't know how to prove it. I'll mention in general that, like... By the way, when you, when you have a problem and you decide the complexity of the problem, a complexity of a problem is a, is a matching upper and lower bound, right? Let's say you have sorting, right? You do sorting, you like, oh, look, I gave an n log n algorithm, merge sort or something, right? Um, and then you give a matching lower bound, then you've decided to determine the complexity of the problem. But uh, how do you give a lower bound on an algorithm, on a problem at all? Any, what, is, what is really a lower bound on a problem? What are the two lower bounds you should know and the only two lower bounds you should know? On any problem, what is the lower bounds you know on the problem? You mean like the inputs that would give those? Just any algorithm ever from the algorithms class 
Name a lower bound you may remember from your algorithms class. Sorting. Doesn't sorting happen? Yeah, that's one. You can prove a n log n lower bound on comparisons, number of comparisons for sorting. There's one more. Hmm? The minimum? The computing the minimum minimum function? Correct. That what's the lower bound on that? Yes. In fact, there's a most problems have a O of n lower bound. Why? What is the one problem that doesn't have an O of n lower bound? Binary search. An O of n lower bound basically means you have to read the entire input. If something doesn't have a O of n lower bound, it means that you don't have to read the whole input. The reason binary search is so efficient is simply because you are promised that the input is already sorted. And then you get to do your little jumping thing. That's the only reason binary search works. If you have to first verify that it's sorted and then do binary search, that takes you a little linear time to verify it's sorted, right? So most problems have an O of n lower bound, excuse me, omega of n. Um, most binary search also, I think, has an omega of log n lower bound, right? Um, why, why did I bring this up? Let me think. What I'm trying to remember. Um, oh, how do you prove an upper bound? You prove an upper bound by giving one algorithm. Just like, oh, there exists an algorithm. Upper bound. Done. How do you prove a lower bound? Contradiction or diagonalization or something. Diagonalization. Unlike a concrete problem, for example, like uh, linear programming or something. Yeah. It's like an adversarial argument. Adversarial arguments. I'm not familiar with that exactly, but it is certainly harder to make a lower bound argument. The, what I was—I guess what I was trying to uh, what I was trying to emphasize is that we have lots of upper bound results. Every single algorithm is an upper bound result. How many lower bound bound results do we have? Like two of all time. That's it. A lower bound result is you have to prove for all possible algorithms. Each one which correctly does decide a certain language or solve a certain problem must take a minimum number of steps. How do you prove that for all possible algorithms? The space of algorithms is infinite. Algorithms are, algorithms are allowed to do a lot of creative things, as we've seen. How do you prove no matter what the algorithm is, it must take this minimum number of steps? That for all quantifier there on the lower bound is what basically our failure to prove lower bounds as theorists. We have no idea how to prove significant lower bounds on problems. And exactly, if we could prove lower bounds, we could actually prove p does not equal np as well. So those two problems are linked in some sense. Right. Um, so let's continue with the form. Any questions on that, on that ramble? Yeah. Like a single lower bound on an incomplete problem, and you've proved p not If you can prove that no algorithm solves sat faster than not even polynomial steps, but super polynomial steps, not even exponential. If you prove every algorithm that solves sat must take a minimum number of steps greater than n to the log n, you've proven p does not equal np. Every, uh, p does not equal np, is, we write it as one problem, but today we'll even show it's related to 1,000 problems. There are 10,000 problems that are deviously, perhaps not biconditionally so, like not if and only if, but imply or are implied by p does not equal np, including the existence of one-way functions. The hash function that the internet uses, that only exists, that has observed observed statistical properties. It only provably has those properties if p does not equal np. Um, any lower bound on a np-complete problem or even an np-intermediate problem. Uh, any non, we have lower bounds actually on some problems, but they are not known to be an np either. They're bigger. So we'll talk about this uh, today. All right, we're formalizing a measure of computation. There's many things you can measure in computational complexity. Uh, what are the most important resources in computational complexity? Time and space. Time and space. There's other things you could measure. You could measure joules. You could measure the number of random bits accessed. You could measure the number of certain kinds of instructions. You could measure the number of gates, the depth of a circuit. All kinds of weird things can be measured. Time, now we need a good mo notion of measuring, like what, is, what does it mean for an algorithm to take a certain, a certain time? By time, we don't mean like you take a stopwatch and you start and stop it, because then every algorithm actually runs in finite time. By time, you should know, have a good understanding of this, we mean 
a number of computational steps that the program takes. But what, is it, what does a step of computation really mean? We need to formalize a model of computation. Give me a model of computation. Which one? Uh, when we say like the one-way tape. Let's try the one tape, one-way deterministic Turing machine. That's a model of computation. Today we'll talk about this, but the model of computation doesn't matter. What are some other models of computation? Anything that's Turing complete? Python. Python. Oh, God. Um, how do you measure the complexity of Python? That's too complicated. I'm not going to formalize a, a, a computation model that is Python in its instructions. Yes? Multiple Turing machines, which can... Yes, in a, in, a, in a distributed system setting, the way that a protocol is defined is multiple Turing machines which can write on each other's tape. That's how they get around the network access thing. Instead of sending the message, they just move one of the tape heads on the other guy's wire, right? Um, that is actually how communication complexity is formalized. We're going to formalize time for now. Oh, yeah, communication complexity. Communication, the number of bits need to be sent. That's another model computation. Let's do time. The answer I'm looking for is like the K-tape Turing machine, deterministic Turing machine. We also have the non-deterministic Turing machine. This is not a, like a reasonable model computation. We all remember what the non-deterministic Turing machine does, right? It has non-determinism. We'll talk about that uh, in the second half of the lecture. But it's not really one worthy of consideration. There's also something called the word RAM model. The word RAM model of a, have you guys heard word RAM before? Word RAM model is basically like, the Turing machine is weird, okay? Um, if you think about it, the Turing machine has to loop left and right on its tape. But that's bad. Binary research on a Turing machine actually takes linear time. It doesn't take log n time. How do you jump and then jump and then jump? You have to like loop. It takes you this many steps to walk over here. And then you're like, okay, got to go there. You're going to take this many steps to walk over there. It has to go left and right one at a time. So you have to count those steps. The word RAM model is basically like a Turing machine, except um, it allowed a small miniature instruction set, like read, write, move. And then, but it's also got jump instructions and things like this. And Technically, not really, but like nobody cares about this, but technically all algorithms are formalized on the automata that is the word RAM model. The word is the word size. It's like 64 bits, right? What, it really, what the word RAM model is really having is like, you know, sigma is equal to 2 to the 64 for a 64-bit computer, something like this. You don't read and write to a single bit at a time. You read and write to a word at a time, and a word is of a certain fixed constant size, right? You want to store more information, chains of words. Some minimal instruction set, something like this. Um, what other models of computation are there? Two-way infinite tape uh, is fine. Uh, OK, let's compare and, con yeah? Quantum computers have not been demonstrated yet. And anyone who says they have is trying to sell you something. Um, so I'm, I'll revisit this lecture in five years and see if that changes. But it hasn't changed from last year. The, the quantum computer is a, is a hypothetical automata. And um, the study of what we're doing, at least for now, is going to be on deterministic normal classes. So that's not unrelated, but it's a different question than the one we're on right now. Um, right. So let's just, the, I'm going to try to prove to you that the model of computation does matter here. They're all Turing complete. But so we know in terms of possibility, they, nothing matters. Like they can all do the same stuff, simulation one on the other. But, and by the church turing thesis. But we'll prove that they, the computation doesn't matter. So let's give certain specific algorithms to decide a language. Let's do um, the language of palindromes. So we want to decide if a string is a palindrome or not. Let's do this on a one-tape deterministic Turing machine first, okay? And then I'm going to give you an algorithm. You give me the time complexity, okay? Actually, you give me the algorithm. Give me a one-tape deterministic Turing machine algorithm to determine uh, if a string is a palindrome or not. How would you program a Turing machine to decide palindromes, efficient or otherwise? When you read the first character and go to a set of states based on what that is, then you travel all the way to the end until you see a blank. You go back, you read the last character, check that they match. 
then mark that off and go back to the second character and repeat until you reach a middle state. Okay, so let's start at this A. I'm gonna go here, and I'm gonna go here, and then I'm at the A, okay? Then, I, as you said, I record A in the states, and I mark it. I'm just gonna not mark it, I'm just gonna pretend I marked it. Now I'm gonna go make sure the Bs match. So instead of going all the way here, I'm just gonna go to here first, right? And then I'm gonna go to the B, right? Then I know the Bs match, so I'm gonna go to the C. I'm gonna go right to the C, right? Um, let's count the number of move operations, because this Turing machine spends a lot of time jumping around. What's the number of steps this top piece takes? If the input is of size n, What's the top uh, piece? How long does that take? N step. N minus one. Big O, it doesn't matter, but we'll prove that, why, why it doesn't matter. Um, Mike, it would probably be N plus one, right? Because you have to know when you're at the end and then go back. One, two, three, four, okay, N. So then you read the blank that's left and then you go back. Well, so, okay. Let's just say it's N then. <laughs> we'll, come, we'll average our answers. Um, how long does that take? Um, what about this one? Minus two. Yeah. This one takes one. This one takes what? Minus yeah. So let's, and then you'll keep doing that until you basically hit the symbols in the middle, right? So, so what is, what is that, what is n plus one plus n minus two plus one plus n minus four plus one uh, plus that, that, that? In terms of a big O, what is a big O of this summation? N squared. N squared. Do you guys remember why? Because you have the, or like Gauss's formula or something, it's like N times N plus 1 over 2. Yeah. 1 plus 2 plus, that, 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 plus N is equal to N times N minus 1 over, N plus 1 over 2, excuse me. Right. So it's like it takes like O of N steps, you know. O of N squared steps, excuse me. This is an O of N squared time algorithm. Kind of not that good, but I mean that's an algorithm. Let's give an algorithm on a deterministic two-tape Turing machine. Two tapes is better than one tape, right? Let's give a more efficient algorithm for this. Here's what our two-tape Turing machine is going to look like. The machine is initialized on the input only on one tape, uh, A, B, C, that, that, C, B, A. And then let's say our second tape is here. So here's how our routine is going to go. We're going to do the following. First, we're going to copy the input. So this is the start. We're going to copy input to second tape. We're going to be in a configuration that looks like this. Okay. The two tape heads are going to be uh, at the end. Okay, we copied the input to the second tape. So we read A, wrote A, moved right. Read A, read B, mo read, wrote B, moved right. Okay, then we're going to reset one head. Let's do the top head. Okay. Now what we're going to do is move the heads towards each other, checking that they're equal. So I'm going to do that by drawing some speed lines. Okay. The two heads are going to loop towards each other, checking that the, they read the same symbol. Recall the multi-tape Turing machine reads both at the same time, writes both, and moves both independently. So this does correctly decide palindromes. Do you agree? Uh, what's the time complexity of this one? How many steps does this Turing machine take? Well. Copying, you start here, you copy the input to the second tape. That takes n steps-ish. Then you reset one head. That takes n. And then you loop towards them and towards each other. That also takes n. So that's like 3 of n, which is equal to O of n, right? OK, so this is a two-tape deterministic Turing machine for an, uh, that takes O of n. The one tape took O of n squared. Can you do better than O of n on a two-tape two Turing machine? Why not? Because you have to read the whole input. If any algorithm somehow does better than O of n, 
that means it doesn't have time to read the entire input. It takes n steps to read the input. You should so, change the letter it doesn't read. Hmm? You should change the letter it doesn't read. Exactly. Assume to the contrary, it took, it took exactly n minus 1 steps. Here's a string it'll be wrong on. You can always construct such a counterexample to the correctness. This is, so this, we have a matching upper and lower bounds. Hopefully you remember from big O what that means. Um, all right, so we see that we have a linear time algorithm. In fact, in Python, you could even do linear time, this problem, right? It just, you would do like a for i in range n, you would do like uh, if uh, array of i is equal to array of n minus i, continue, right? Something like this. That takes linear time. You loop over the string. Um, can you do better on a one-tape Turing machine than O of n squared? The O of n squared algorithm actually, when you take a double look at it, is kind of bad. You have to go all the way from end to end. Is there not some way to like do that a little smarter at all? What do we think? Can you think of a linear time or perhaps like n log n time or something other Turing machine specific algorithm for a one tape deterministic Turing machine? you reverse the second half? No, never mind. That'd be still too much. I'd love to ask you guys a question that is a trick, because it has been proven that no such algorithm exists. On a one-tape deterministic Turing machine, it must take exactly, it must take O of n squared steps on a one-tape deterministic Turing machine. The proof is graphic. It's from the 60s. It uses this difficult combinatorial argument. You like put a symbol on the tape, and you count the number of times the tape head crosses over it. And from that, you can derive a function of the number of steps. And you must show it's n squared, something really bad. 18-page paper. Some time in the 80s, somebody found like a, like a seven-page paper where they used the method of incompressibility, Kolmogorov complexity argument. This is why Kolmogorov complexity is so powerful, so important. Really short proof. They proved like if there did exist a one-tape deterministic Turing machine that could decide palindromes in little o of n squared, then you could actually use that one tape deterministic Turing machine in a complicated way to uh, compress a string too small. You could use a description of that machine to store a number smaller than log n bits, which we know should not be possible. So it must take at least n squared, right? Um, that proof takes like four pages. In fact, I've given that proof as a final exam for this course before. Just that proof. It's not too, it's not too challenging, but there's a lot of moving parts in it. Um, so anyway, we see that the computational model does matter. Unlike the Turing machine, where we're like, oh, look, I'm going to read the input. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to do my thing. So here we're trying to measure the number of steps here. We have a clear lower bound on a problem, and then we have a clear linear time, linear time uh, complexity, quadratic complexity. Big difference between those two, right? Uh, so the computational, matter, mo the computational model does matter. So let's make sure that it doesn't matter. Any questions on this? How do we formally define big theta? Big theta is uh, is if big theta is true if uh, O of n and uh, omega of n. Theta is like you have matching lower and upper bounds. I see. Asymptotically tight. And so it, like if you cannot construct such bounds and like there is no meaningful way to talk about big theta? Correct. Like big theta is the lower bound, which is the hard one to prove. How do you prove a function stays above something? You can prove a function stays below something by just giving an upper bound. You can't, it's really hard to give a lower bound, right? Um, another thing, uh, while we're on the topic of big O, uh, the reason we use big O and we don't con consider like concrete complexity is because the Turing machine, the big O is invented really because of hacks that people do on the Turing machine, okay? Consider we do palindromes, consider we decide palindromes. On the, on the alphabet A, B, okay? You can do palindromes in linear time, okay? You can do it in, n st you can do it in three n steps, okay? But if you change the alphabet to be sigma squared, A times A, A times B, B times A, B times B, 
you can actually run your Turing machine twice as fast because now you're looking at two letters at a time. So then if this machine took three n steps with an alphabet like this, this one takes three n over two steps. Now what if you set it to be an alphabet that's two to the size two to the sixty-four? You can solve most inputs in constant time, but a lot of things will still take time. You can have a multiplicative speed up by any constant you want. The reason we have big O is because of the when you formalize the Turing machine, you can just say I'm going to switch from 32-bit computing to 64-bit computing, and suddenly everything is like faster. That is, we don't care. That the actual concreteness of the algorithm should be independent of the alphabet as well. And other little hacks you can do, right? This is the reason we use big O. It's because of uh, issues with formalization of computation. This is why. It's not just because it's convenient and, and polite and it makes things clean. It makes things, it's the only way to study these problems, in fact. Any questions on that? OK. Um, OK, let's talk about some complexity classes now. So uh, we will write time f of n to mean the class of language is decidable by a Turing machine, perhaps of a specific formulation, which halts in O of f of n steps. So we may say L is in time f of n is if uh, W is an L, if and only if, there, let's say there exists some Turing machine M, W is an L, and M accepts. W, a W is not an L if and only if M rejects a W. And M, um, let's say, if uh, W is equal to N, M takes M on input W takes no more than uh, o of f of n steps. No machine is allowed to loop. No machine is allowed to do anything like that. Okay. In fact, every complexity class is a subset of the decidable languages. We're concerned with the machines. The machine decides the language, and also that the uh, machine has a time bound. By the fact that the machine has a time bound, we say that the machine halts. No algorithm is allowed to loop our definitions here. So this, given a specific language, there exists multiple machines to decide that language, right? Again, a language is a set of strings. There exists all kinds of algorithms of matching upper and lower bounds to decide a language. We're usually concerned with the best one. Um, certainly, there's some interesting properties about this, this time class already. You could probably guess the time of n squared is like a strict subset. Well, we don't know if it's a strict subset. You know it's a subset of time uh, n cubed, right? Class any language is in here. That means there exists a n squared time algorithm to decide it. Why does there exist a t n cube time algorithm to decide it? Just run the n squared one. Or if you need to be exactly n cubed, you just run the n squared one at times. N yeah. The yeah, great part about using the big O notation is we get to absolve ourselves of that because n squared is O of n cubed already. Um, unlike computability theory where we solved most questions, there's going to be a lot of notation in complexity theory simply because we don't know if any things are equal. And the definitions of them have subtle differences. There are other such classes that will define space of f of n. Is, uh, we'll talk about this in like a week. We'll actually come back from break. Like space complexity, the number of cells the Turing machine uses. We have n time, which is the non-deterministic time, a non the time a non-deterministic Turing machine takes. Then we also have n space, the space complexity of a non-deterministic Turing machine, and so on, right? We have all these kinds of base classes. Class that is the point of today is this class you may have heard of. It's called P. P is going to be equal to the union of, of k is equal to 0 to infinity of time uh, n to the k. 
So P is the class of languages which each language in this class takes polynomial time to decide. We've seen P in algorithms, right? Most problems that we care about efficiently are in P, right? Um, P is a really good class, really healthy, strong class. Uh, let me give you four reasons why I love the class P. P, OK, we gave the, the class of the decidable languages as ones that have Turing machines to decide them at all. P is a class, I claim, that is a class of languages which uh, consists of problems which are efficiently decidable. So decidable at all, efficiently decidable. Now, your next question should be, why does the polynomial bound correspond to an intuitive notion of efficiency? Let me give you four reasons for that. Yeah. One. Um, so, like, if a language is in P, it means that you have some non-trivial understanding mathematically of what the problem is saying, right? Most problems have brute force solutions. Most of them do. But... If you can bring a problem from having an exponential time solution to a polynomial time solution, you do so with non-trivial mathematical understanding of what the problem is. That is what corresponds to, we think, efficiency. If you have an interesting mathematical theorem and it helps you speed up the algorithm, great. So to put a problem in P requires uh, deeper mathematics. To put a problem outside of P, like in exponential time, is easy. Most problems can rely on exponential time. Imagine a, like a graph search algorithm, OK? If S, node S is reachable to T. Here's a bad way. Brute force search all possible paths through the graph, and then just check if one, one of them is the path from S to T. Mm, that takes exponential time. Now, graph algorithms specifically rely on local properties of the graph. Oh, look, every node that's in between those is connected to a node between those, connected nodes between those, and so on, right? Ridiculous, almost. This, you've been working with this for so long, you kind of forgot. Maybe that's why what it is. Two, um, polynomial time is polynomials as mathematical objects are closed under the mathematical operations that we think efficiency should be closed, over, closed under. Okay? If f and g are polynomials, then so is f plus g. Right? That's a polynomial. The sum of polynomials is the pol polynomial. The composition of polynomials is a polynomial. Uh, the product of polynomials is a polynomial. So if you have several algorithms and you want to compose them naturally, like run one, then run the other, that will be efficient. If you want to run one for every step that one takes, you want to run a whole other algorithm, that should be efficient. If you want to run uh, one and then the other, or you know, other, uh, anything that we think like efficient plus efficient should be efficient, it's closed under. Now if you have exponential time and polynomial time, the combination of bad and good should be bad. Good and good should be good. So polynomial time is closed under these nice con operations. Concatenation even, star, whatever, right? Here's another reason. P is closed under complement. Why? Because you can find all the correct solutions and then just subtract that from the set of all solutions. Why does that take polynomial time? That's correct. Because there's n possible. So let's say L is in P. That means there exists a polynomial time algorithm for P. This algorithm runs in a polynomial number of steps and says yes and no oh, to all inputs. It's, it's not going to loop, so we can just flip the accept and reject. Exactly. Control F, return true for return false. Swap those around. Congrats. You've proven an algorithm that does the opposite, right? Not all classes are close under complementation. Uh, decidable, lang no, recognizable languages certainly aren't. Um, yeah, so P better be closer than complement, because intuitive sounds like it should be closer than complement. Uh, three, now, okay, like, uh, what's the worst runtime of an algorithm you've ever seen? Polynomial, though. What's the worst polynomial runtime? You've seen an exponential runtime on Knapsack. What is a, what is a polynomial runtime that's bad that you've seen? Yeah. Oh, boy. That's exponential time. Wait, aren't there like, isn't there polynomial time? Oh, sorry, 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 not sad. Um, 
The opposite of sad, in fact. Sorry, what? LP? Which one? Mm, that's actually a very complicated question. People have developed entire techniques of analyzing the analysis of algorithms to determine why does, in theory, LP have exponential time algorithms, but in practice, it's efficient looking. So let's forget that. Smooth analysis, it's called. Let's not think about that one. That's a Are interior point methods provably find the right solution in an open cube? Average case. Really? Yes. I think they're exponential time. See. Don't hold me to that. I'm not an expert on that. Fair I enough. think it's exponential time. I don't know, like the control algorithm I run takes O of n to the fourth. Okay, O of n to the fourth. Anyone have anyone can beat a polynomial time algorithm for O of n to the fourth? I don't remember what this was, but I know there used to be an algorithm that was like O of n to the twenty. Like it used to be an MP complete problem that we found like an n to the twenty algorithm. But I don't know what problem it was. Probably wasn't NP complete then. That would be I thought it was MP complete. Well, if it was actually NP complete, then that would prove P equals NP, as we'll see next week. But it was, I believe it's hard. I be, oh, primality testing we believed. No, pr yeah, primality, deterministic primality testing we believed to be uh, deterministically not NP, and then somehow it was in P one day. And to the fourth as well, AKS 2004. Um, okay, I win. The best, the worst polynomial runtime of an algorithm I've seen is N to the eight. Um, this is not efficient at all. I implemented, this is called the LLL algorithm. Uh, it's not important what it solves. It finds a short orthonormal basis of a lattice. It's named after Lenstra, Lenstra and Lovaz. No, Lovaz, Lenstra, and Lenstra. Two of them are brothers. I don't know which, which L goes to which Lenstra. Um, basically, like, this was a problem that was thought to be very hard. It was like exponential time. And then suddenly they found a great way to do it. But I implemented the algorithm, and then I go to my terminal, and I type in an input, and I hit enter, and the terminal hangs. Okay, n to the eight, you couldn't really like if if even on small inputs, this algorithm does not appear to stop in an hour. Like inputs of size two, can we say this is an efficient algorithm or not? Here's the thing: is like what le the, what the three L guys brought to the table was not just the fact that they had the the reason they were excited about polynomial at all, even though it appears technically intractable, is because they found deep mathematical understanding of the problem they were trying to solve. Then it gets handed over to engineers. After they found this polynomial time algorithm, these other guys are doing things that are hard to measure concretely and how efficient it is. These guys found like pruning algorithms. Oh, let's do this. And then, oh, I found this optimization hardware thing. And then I go to the number theory library. I find their version of LLL. It stops on inputs instantly that, I, like, if you were to use measure time complexity with a stopwatch, which you're not supposed to, it appears to stop instantaneously on any input. So once they brought the problem from way outside of P to within P, other people will optimize it down. The fact that we couldn't think of many hard problems, n to the fourth is the biggest one, means that there are not really problems of like n to the hundred, right? We can prove, in fact, theoretically, there do exist problems of time complexity n to the hundred, which cannot be done any faster than n to the 99. You can prove such problems exist for all n. But the proofs is done by diagonalization is inherently non-constructive. We don't have like real good problems that are like, yeah, this is polynomial, but high polynomial, you know? Also, like, so, like, why, if your question is, like, why should this be regarded as efficient, but something like O of n to the log log n not be regarded as efficient, n to the log log n appears small, but it outgrows every polynomial eventually, right? This is, we don't have ways to convert this to practically efficient algorithms. We appear to have ways to convert this to practically efficient algorithms. So polynomial time, even high degree polynomials, they don't show up in practice. So it's okay we just say polynomial time. That, that allows us to get the closure properties we want. Rather than just say like n to the fourth. And n to the fifth is not, tra is not tractable. n to the fifth is, um, we'll determine n to the fifth to be not feasible and then n to the fourth feasible. That kind of distinction doesn't make too much sense for us. Um, final answer is that uh, it's really convenient for us to assume that P is the efficiency class because we just proved that different computational models take different time. But there is something called the extended Church-Turing thesis, which doesn't have any of the philosophy backing up it, just like the Church-Turing thesis. Basically, it says all feasible models of computation can simulate each other, which is basically kind of a variant of what the Church-Turing thesis says. But it adds this addendum, which is that the simulation is efficient. Any computational model can simulate another. Any reasonable computational model can simulate another with uh, polynomial overhead. So of the three automata we gave, the strongest one is the word RAM model. 
right? That seems to be the fastest. The slowest one is the one tape deterministic Turing machine. Uh, I think I don't remember exactly if the word RAM, if a word RAM algorithm takes uh, t steps, then there exists a one tape DTM, which will take t to the four steps, right? And then you can go between two tape and one tape and something like this and like n log n or something, right? So uh, not only can these models of computation simulate each other, but the simulation between them is polynomial. Now, this doesn't have as much backing as the church turing thesis does with all this philosophy, but it does have a lot of evidence in its favor. We don't consider the non-deterministic Turing machine or the quantum automata, those models, to be to satisfy this requirement, though. Um, so by studying P, we don't have to care about the machine. We can just la 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 think about algorithms in general. You know, it's not going to be as concrete on. Oh no, we have two tapes or one tape. Right. Um, great. We know what the class P is. That took one hour. Any questions? All right. Uh, let's take a break, and then we'll talk for an hour about NP.